morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, David, to present another paper this year. Um, passive or imperative? So um, I suppose most Hebrew Bible scholars are trained from the start to think of when they see this word as a passive participle. And um, we kind of take that for granted. Um, it is read or it, it is to be read, maybe more uh, paraphrastically. Um, and we are trained to think of this in contrast with its partner, kativ, which of course is a, a, a passive participle, what is written. And many voices in Masora studies for the Hebrew Bible student that they would look to are going to uh, echo this definition. And today I want to challenge this. I, uh, three things I would like to do today is uh, demonstrate that the word kare, kare, however we're going to set aside vocalization, this word spelled kufresh yod uh, was not always understood this way by the Masoretes, that is as, not always as a passive participle. Two, I want to expose what I believe is an inconsistency and perhaps even a confusion among modern scholarly treatments of, of this topic. And then three, suggest an alternative way to understand certain Masoretic notes, both in uh, the uh, Masoretic Ketana and the Gedola, that employ the words uh, Ketiv or Ketav and Kufresh Yod, along with their various abbreviations. Um, after an initial introduction, this paper will have three parts corresponding to the parts on your handout. Uh, but first, before we get to the handout, um, well, here's, here's, a, here's a text I want to kind of uh, prime the pump with here. This is from Abachia ben Asher, who was, a, who was a kind of an early uh, uh, Kabbalist, lived in the 13th century, 14th, early 14th century, in his commentary on Mishnah Avot 1-1, Moshe Kibel Torah Misinah, etc. He writes, Afilu kariv ketiv ne'amar Moshe Besinai, or Basinai. And you'll notice here Ne'emar is in the singular. So here we have uh, just a data point where uh, a rabbi in this, in this time frame, 13th, early 14th century, has a conception of kariva kativ as some sort of unit. And what I'm going to argue today and hope to demonstrate is that this is a new, this is a new thing in the, somewhere by the 13th century. Um, I know we have two, we have doctors, Minot and Brian Crawford here today. This is just one example of, of the, uh, the education that a Hebrew Bible student would encounter. And this is from the Masora of the VHS, pages, uh, an excerpt from page 40 and from 41. Kari uh, Welakativ, words read but not written, Nedarim 37b, 38a, also mentions seven passages where a word is to be read, although it is not written in the text. and, and uh, uh, we have the, the shorthand here, um, but we're taught, the student is taught that these are abbreviations of an Aramaic pe'il participle. Uh, and then we see on the next page, kare uh, walakativ, the opposite, flipping the, the, the verbs, uh, uh, read but not written. Um, oh wait, I, that's my, I made a typo. I'm sorry, those are both the same, uh, anyway. The point, my, my second slide, or my second item here is, is a duplicate. It was supposed to be the other, my mistake. But nevertheless, the point is that in a, uh, an education context, we're going to be trained to think of kufratio as a passive participle. Here's an excerpt from the Anchor Bible Dictionary from uh, Morrow, uh, pages 25 and 27. He says the words kativ and kare are Aramaic pe'il uh, pe participles, meaning what is written and what is read, respectively. The traditional pronunciation of the word kari as kari arose by analogy with the vocalization of the word kativ. The term kari has been interpreted both as an imperative form and as a participle, passive participle. Its identity as a passive participle can be demonstrated or determined, however, by analogy with the use of the term kativ in Masoretic notes of the type Ketivin, Ketivin probably, uh, Wallach uh, Kariin, and notice that he's, he's got a yod here uh, indicating the, the passive. 
Uh, again, Morrow writes, uh, the testimony, or testimony to the oldest independent list of Karei variants is found in, again, Nedarim 37b of the Bavli. And he, he translates for us, Rabbi Isaac said, the pronunciation of the scribes, the omissions of the scribes, words read which are not written in the text, words written in the text but not read, are all a law of Moses from Sinai. Uh, the text continues with examples of each of these classes. Rabbi Isaac belonged to the third generation of Amorim and taught in Babylon toward the close of the third century CE. So Morrow, uh, looking at a list of the generations of Amoraim, places, and I imagine uh, the, his reader here would take this site, this uh, Baraita from the Bavli and imagine that this originated, uh, this wording originated back in the third century. Um, Israel Yavin identifies, I just want to set the table here before we dive into our handout, uh, three, what he calls the earliest categories of Kari Kativ. This is in his introduction to Tiberian Misra. The first is the perpetual Kare. So we have the Tetragrammaton, we have uh, Jerusalem, as we know, vocalized as a dual Yerushalayim, and so on and so forth. Uh, those are uh, unmarked in the Mesorah in terms of any list. But the, uh, the numbers two and three of these earliest categories that Yavin identifies are what I'm going to look at today. The first, uh, Yavin identifies as Kareva la Kativ, Kativ la Kare. And here we have an example from the Aleppo Codex at Ruth 317. Uh, we have uh, Ki Amar, and then we, have, we see the circle here pointing to Eli, to me. And then we have this, this note here, Kareva la Kativ, according to what Yavin. Uh, this is to be read, but it is not written. Uh, and then, so that's one of the earliest. The third earliest that Yavin identifies is what he calls euphemisms. Um, here's another example from the Aleppo Codex. Um, we have the circle over Ophelim, and it's Uvat Tehorim, is uh, according to the vowels of the text, of course, with these consonants. And then we just have this word, Kufresh Yod. Uh, so in turn, I want to take uh, each of these and look at them. But first, uh, we're going to go to our first item on the handout, which is uh, a survey of the use of this word, kufreishiod. So just this inflection, not any um, other uh, inflections or verbal forms from that root. And uh, just to, for the sake of time, uh, there, what, there is one at Qumran, that is identified by Ed Cook, and it's clearly an imperative. Uh, call for me, my son. Uh, uh, oh, I don't have, I think I've got an old. Tim, would you, would you bring me one? I think I have an old. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's small type, isn't it? I tried to cram it onto two. Uh, my son, summon to me the angels. That's the, that's the translation that Cook provides in his Dictionary of Qumran Aramaic. It's the only time that I could find uh, where we have this, this word in Qumran. Not that it, it gets into the Masorah, but just, just for fun, it's there. In the Targumim, it appears uh, as a translation of a Hebrew imperative. Um, the Isaiah 29 is a nice verse. It yehev sifra de la yada sifra le memar kari kandin, which is, so read this, please from the Hebrew, which I have there in the brackets. So uh, read, we have it in Hosea as well. Um, and there's other examples in the Targum. Uh, here's uh, several examples from the Jerusalem Talmud. Now, granted, the difficulties with our Talmud quotes is access to early manuscripts for, for me in terms of the Yerushalmi. Um, so I did the best I could plug in through the online uh, Leiden manuscripts. Um, but just if you skim through these, we'll see Kufresh Yod, by context, is used as an imperative. Now, some of them, like the Yerushalmi Sanhedrin 20b, the first one could be argued as a participle, maybe, at, you know, a participle, but uh, Sokolov, in his uh, Dictionary of Jewish Palestinian Aramaic, actually tags this as an imperative, singular. Um, and you go down, um, these basically deal with uh, 
cues or instructions to, to cite the text of scripture. Um, for example, the Sanhedrin 7-7, uh, how do we know that uh, the one upon whom it is committed is also covered by the law? And it cites Leviticus 18-22, but then it says, read it, karive, you shall, and then it changes the form to nifal, tishachev, lo tichashev. So karive, lo tichashev. So it's a revocalization of the scripture being prompted by the imperative kari. And that's, that's what's happening with these. Uh, a, a fun one that is believed to be a Palestinian origin is the Genesis Rabbah 39.11, where it says, be a blessing, the Lord says to Abram. And it says, a, read a pool. Just as a pool uh, purifies the unclean, so too, you bring near those who are far and purify them for their father who is in heaven. So again, we have the imperative kuf ratio, kari, uh, followed by an alternative vocalization, sometimes midrashic, uh, sometimes halakhic. Uh, we look to the bavli and we see, here's some examples of the same thing. Um, the Pesachim 118a, lo tisa do not lift up a false report, but then it says, Karive, read it, and then this is difficult, Lo Tashi, maybe, from Nun Shin, Aleph, do not deceive, do not cause someone to go astray. Um, but that's it. it. As far as I could see in all these, I couldn't find one example where Kuf Reish Yod could be clearly demonstrated by context to be a passive participle. And then I, I looked at Rashi, just to throw something in that was a little later, and Rashi follows suit with the Talmud. Um, he quotes a couple things that uh, are, would have been accessible to him in the Midrash um, that show like maybe he had a little knowledge of Masora, but he uses Karive quite a bit that you see here. And um, one other point that I don't, didn't fit on the, the, the uh, out, outline here is that in the Bavli and in Rashi, when there's a contrast between kativ, it is written, and then some form of the root kufresh yod, the bavli and then rashi follow suit, it's in the active, karinan. Kativ x, karinan y. We read. So bavli does that. There's no examples in the bavli, in other words, of kativ blank and kari something else. The bavli shifts the voice to an active uh, we, present tense. Okay, so that, the, the, the point with this first page then is just, a, it was just a scouring to the best of my resources, I, of course I didn't get everything here, to just see, are there, do we have any traction with Kufresh Yod being understood and used in any significant way with the reading of scripture as a passive participle? And my answer is no, I can't find any. Even up to 11th century. At least there's a trajectory there. Okay, so now we're going to move on here to part two. So this will get us into page two, or the, the second page of our uh, handout here. Uh, and I want to, so this is going to take us back to Bavli Nedarim 37a and its Masoretic parallels. Um, back to Morrow's translation, Rabbi Isaac said the pronunciation, the scribes, etc. We're interested in this last bit. Words read, which are not written in the text, words written in the text but not read are a law of Moses from Sinai, which is halakha le Moshe Messinai, which uh, uh, Christine Hayes wrote a, a really thorough essay on this years ago, um, basically scouring through the Mishnah, the Tosefta, Yerushalmi, and the Bavli, where this trope uh, halakha le Moshe Messinai is used, and uh, basically comes to the point uh, that in, by the time of the Bavli, this uh, means it's, an, it's a non-scriptural tradition that is that it can't be changed, and it has equal authority. This is the as idea of how it's operating in the minds of the, of the sages of the Gemara. Uh, so I have here a, a, a snapshot taken from the Vilna edition, and you'll see here, so that the citation that Maro translates for us starts here, Amar Rabbi Yitzha, right? Mikra Sofrim, Itur Sofrim, and then we have this phrase, Krinan Bala Tivan, or Tivin, if this is a plural, um, and then the opposite, 
Halakha al Moshe Mussinai. Um, and then we have 14th century Spanish commentator, the Ran, who's uh, uh, Nassim ben Reuven, and notice what he says here. Now, this is the Vilna printing. So the Vilna provides us with the same text. But notice uh, what uh, the Ran says. He says, Tevot hanikraot velo niktavot. Words that are nifal, nifal participle. Nikraot velo niktavot. And then the opposite, she niktavot ve'enan nikraot. So he uses, again, he's thinking of this text. Now, the, the, the Vilna edition doesn't exist till the 1800s. But we have here a, a data point, again, of a 14th century Spanish uh, rabbi who is understanding this uh, baraita from the Bavli that Masora studies depends on so much as clearly as a passive participle. What I'm going to suggest, just like with the quote from Bakhya ben Asher, who lived roughly contemporaneously, um, this was an innovation. Um, and came, who came to my rescue while I was um, researching this, wondering if I even had an idea at all, is uh, Michael Sokolov's Dictionary of Babylonian Jewish Aramaic, Jewish Babylonian Aramaic, pardon me, and notice what Dr. Sokolov gives. So this is under Kufratio, the entry. Notice how he cites it. He cites it not as a passive, but katvin, active participle. And notice how he translates. Words which are read and not written. Then he gives us his own kativ. <laughs> Literally, they read and do not write in scripture, and which are written and not read. Literally, they write and do not read. Nedarim 37b. And then he gives, just, I left this on as an example, what we were talking about, how the Bavli does interact with talking about kativ and using kufre shiod. Um, he gives an example here. Kativ ki uh, yutain, I guess, vitrinan ki yutan. So we have kativ and a, a word based on kari, but it's in an active participle with the, with the uh, collective suffix there, the we. So once I saw that in uh, Sokolov's dictionary, I thought, okay, I, I think there's something here. Because we have basically two authorities now disagreeing. We have um, the Ron from 14th century Spain reading it as passive participles, tevot hanikraot velo niktavot, etc. And then we have uh, Michael Sokolov uh, several hundred years later saying, no, literally, it's katvin, which is an active participle. Okay, what we're going to do now is go and look at the manuscript tradition that is behind. I'm going to go chronologically through manuscripts, even though the Bavli is, we're going to suggest, is older than our, than our oldest uh, Masora manuscripts. I'm going on a timeline of manuscript dates. Okay, so I'm going to put Masora before the Bavli. Do you see why? Because our, oh, I'm going just by dates of manuscripts. And from the Cairo Codex here, 895, uh, roughly the year, notice we have, this is the upper uh, Masora Gedola at Judges 2013. It's, sorry, this was the best resolution I could get. <laughs> but notice the note here. 10 curry with a dot, the la cut with a dot. Sorry, that's it's a holum. Uh, that's my best I could do. The dots are actually right above the last letter. I was unable to re replicate that. Then the upper Masorga Dalat, Jeremiah 38, 16. Notice we have the list first. Then there's some smudge here. I don't know what it is. But then it says, Ailing, these are eight Patvala Kar with the dots. So this is our uh, Cairo Codex. Here's a couple more from the Cairo Codex. Left margin. This is really interesting to me. A left margin note at Jeremiah 39, 12. Um, eight melin kat kar. It's telling the reader, it's, it's evoking in the reader the memory of the list. It's not an instruction. And then finally, and thanks to David for emailing me a scan of this, because this one was totally illegible to me. So this is uh, from uh, Castro's um, transcription of this uh, Masora at the bottom of 50, Jeremiah 51.3. Eilin kat, or kata valakri 
and then and there are signs. And so here's the, the list again. So this is all late 9th century Cairo Codex. Uh, we don't have any Talmud manuscripts of the Bavli this old. So that's why we're starting with the Masora and coming forward. The Petrograd Codex, here's, here's where I was really thought uh, this was worthwhile, was notice here's a, a 10th century uh, codex, and notice at Jeremiah 39.12, it's hard to read here, uh, but it's much clearer. I, I type it here. Had min, that here is one of eight milim de katvin velakar with the dot. And notice we have the active participle. Uh, but what I thought was really gold was the Ezekiel 48 at the bottom. We have, both, we have the full name of the list. Eight of or one of eight melin de katvin velakarin. I didn't type the whole thing there, so that just takes us to here. So twice in the, and this is the only time that I know of in the Petrograd that we have uh, this in the Masora Gedola. Aleppo Codex, we're just moving forward in time chrono chronologically. Um, in, in terms of Masora Gedola, at the bottom of Judges 23, uh, 2013, we have a, a list. 10. Notice Kufre Shiod Vala Ketav, not Ketiv, Ketav. And then Leningrad Codex at the top, uh, Masora Gedolat, Ruth 3 5. Aileen Karin, notice no Yod, or I'm sorry, no Vav here, no Cholom. Aileen Karin Vala Katvin, we have the active participle again. So all these manuscripts testify to active participles, which support. Now, I didn't know if Sokolov uh, knew this or not, but he certainly um, was right on. So how so? Well, if we quickly look through the, the manuscript tradition, uh, this is from the Saul Lieberman database. It's all I have in terms of Bavli manuscripts. Uh, the Munich of this passage of Nedarim, Katvin, Katvin. And then uh, we have the list sandwiched by the title. And even the Munich, though, gets to a shorter version. Um, again, I, because we're going chronologically, the Munich is uh, mid-14th century. I, I put uh, the Ron in here again. Uh, the Vatican, which is late 14th century. Katvin, Katvin, active participle, active participle. And then, strangely, though, where it's talking about the Halakala Moshe Messina, it has a yod here. But when it sandwiches the list, I'm kind of fast forwarding through this because I know my time's short. But in the in the Bavli, the list is sandwiched by the title. Title, list, title, and then it gives the title for the flip, list, title again. Um, notice the, the Ginsberg Talmud, I, I wasn't able to find a, a date on this. Um, but notice, clearly passive, Ktivin, Ktivin. The Venice 16th century, Katvin, Katvin, Katvin. Active, 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 but then look at the Vilna printing. Passive, passive, passive. So what I'm suggesting is there's a drift that's happening by the 14th century of the passive, uh, of, pardon me, of the either imperative kari, read, or kari used as a shorthand for they read, according to Sokolov's translation. But by proximity to the passive participle kativ, it's starting to be heard as a passive. And when, as for students of Masora, you get a lot of mileage thinking of it as a passive participle. So that, that's, it's not a bad thing, but it is not, it, it, it's not emic. It's not an emic concept to the Masora texts themselves. It's from a later stage of interpreters of the Masora tradition that are imposing the passive participle kari on the world of the Masorites. Okay, if we continue, this is just the kind of the development over time here, uh, what we've gone through. All these, we have a tradition of the active clearly coming in. If we look at Masechet Sofrim and, and Akla Akla, there's a mix. Sometimes you see it, the active participle, sometimes a passive, sometimes shorthand, and that's something that was beyond my paper today. But in terms of the 20th century, all these, uh, these are different resources I didn't, oh yeah, I have Yevin on here, Dotan, um, Alexander Sperber, Ginsburg, uh, are all teaching according to this paradigm. It's Sokolov, in, in terms of my ability to see, is the only one to, to affirm this. And I, I don't know how much uh, 
Michael Sokolov is aware if he's done this work, and that's why he made the choice he did. Um, I just have maybe a little bit of time to, to talk about the euphemisms, which was a secondary uh, topic. Point being, all our, for the, that's his uh, Bavli Megila 25b, it's also an active. Even though it's passive, it's usually translated passive. Um, when it's written in the text, we, well, we substitute. But it's Korin Otan. We read the Sheva. So I looked at all the Bavli manuscripts. The, we have a little bit of variation with the spelling of Korin, but you always have an active participle. You always have an object. Um, and then in Masechet Sofrim from the Higger edition, um, this is just... Uh, uh, nine eight Elud Ketiv Vikari. There's six times where he has Vikari in his edi uh, his edition. But if you look at his um, his apparatus, his notes, the manuscripts he draws from have have all these variations. Korin active participle. Korin with an olive. Korinan like we saw in the Bavli. We read. Um, there's even one that begins Elud Varim Shekutvin. So. Where, where does all this go? I want to suggest that back to our two examples here, from the, if we just time travel back to the 10th century, and we ask the, uh, the Masora scholars what this note is, my argument is that this is a shorthand for the name of the list. This, that's all this is. This is not Kari Velakativ. This is a shorthand for what we saw back in the Cairo Codex here. It's a shorthand for a reference to the list that probably was already memorized. And of course we know the list isn't exactly the same every time. It's just like Mishnaic lists. It's, there's a list that kind of changes shape but they have a title for the list and um, I want to suggest, so there, there's one use of Kufresh Yod that is not passive. I want to suggest that's a shorthand for the plural active participle. And then with the euphemisms, I would suggest that this is closer to an active, it would be better to read this as an active participle. Read, 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 because just like we saw with the traditions there in section one, we have a, a strong history in Jewish Aramaic of using the active participle to prompt the reader to revocalize the scriptural text using this formula. So, Basically, to recap, I would suggest that of these two, uh, of what Yevin identifies as the earliest strata of Kare Kativ, it is inappropriate to use Kare defined as an act or as a uh, as a uh, peil participle, as a passive participle, but rather a different kind of shorthand. And this might be part of a larger study of kind of seeing strata, because even Yevin says it's not until after, way after the Talmudic times that the Kare Kativ kind of comes into its full. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you made a very good case that the Kativ uh, may not be passive as active, but I wonder why you titled your paper passive or imperative. Oh, yeah. Thank you, David. The, uh, the reason why is because <laughs> I originally submitted the, the once I submitted the paper, I learned a whole bunch of new stuff, and I was trying to I, I kind of kept the paper. I think they uh, kept the title when I didn't have to, maybe in terms of this presentation. My first it, Robert Gordis in as it the biblical text in the making or something. He argues that it's an active to read it as an active, but his his rational rationale is kind of what I talked about last year: the altikra ele. He took the Bavli's and the Midrashim's use of don't read blank, but this um, as a kind of genre of uh, imperative that the Kari would fit with. The, what that didn't solve for me is the law. Because when you have Ketav uh, Vala Kari, you wouldn't have it, you wouldn't have it be, a, it can't be a, uh, an imperative with law in front of it. Right? You can't have a negative uh, command would not be la kari. It would be alti kri. So, um, and I did find um, uh, Eliyahu Halevi in his uh, Masoret HaMasoret, he uses the, the what's it, the ikaved, where's the ikaved, the ikavida. He says, alti, he says, uh, alti kru, he's 
this is what, is it Haggai? Or how, I'm trying to remember. Uh, where there's a, there's a scribal Cree. But he's, he's taken back to where the prophet actually tells the people. And he says, Al tikru, don't you all read ve'ikaved, uh, ele ve'akivda, as if there was a hay at the end. And so he, uh, there is this tradition of thinking back, and that's what, 15th century, of thinking of the Kari as an imperative and the altikra ele that we see in the Midrashim and in the Bavli as of the same kind of genre, prompting a, a, maybe an alternative performance of the scripture. So, um, thanks. Okay. All right.